of Integrative Medicine at Trinity Health of New England, I want to welcome you to this week's installment of Wellness Wednesday. Wellness Wednesday is designed to, in brief, bring you tools for wellness that will benefit you, our colleagues, and our communities at large. I'm Kathy Muller, and I'm here with Tim Michaels, my colleague today, and Tim has brought a special guest with us, too. Tim, tell us what we're going to be talking about today. Well, first, let me identify uh, my colleague, Patrick Muse from Mercy Medical Center up in Springfield, Mass. Uh, Patrick has been working with us on and off, helping the ED staff and other staff at Mercy. Um, and based on a comment he made to me a couple of weeks ago around noticing that with uh, people in his life, himself or his colleagues, that people are stressed and often don't know it. So I thought it would be really important if we just kind of sat down and tried to answer that question. How do people I come in contact with who are demonstrating stress, how do I try to help them um, and get them to hear me? So, Patrick, first, why don't you tell us what you actually do for Mercy? Hi, Tim and Kathy. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Patrick. I'm the Conflict Care Coordinator for Mercy Medical Center. Um, what that means is I primarily work in the emergency department um, with high utilization patients. So, individuals that come in to the ED uh, very frequently, more than 10 times in a year. Um, and what I do is I, I get to know the patients, I look through their medical history. Um, and I try to come up with some root causes and mm -hmm. things that we can address um, with the patients to try to, you know, get them to get their medical care outside of the hospital and live their best life. I love that phrase, live their best life. That is our entire brand promise of, you know, listening takes on a couple of aspects. So like, for example, going through their chart and really digging deep for things that we could do is a form of listening to me. But since you're both really clinical and I am not, I only make believe I'm clinical. Um, <laughs> How, how could it be that we are so stressed out that it's showing up in our speech or in our behaviors or in our shortness with each other, but not really realize it? How could that be happening? Kathy, what are your thoughts? I, I think it's layers, right? So we can have a brief traumatic event and we can know we're stressed because of a death in the family or a car accident. But now we've had this sort of repeated micro trauma and and not just micro trauma we've had big things happen this year too but i think it's the layering it's the layering one on top of the other mm. uh, job insecurity new work i mean for those of us here a new job every week last year and just trying to figure out how we get through covid and now another layer another layer with this new with this new delta threat so i think because it's so gradual, you don't quite know until you're at that tipping point that you're at that tipping point. And sometimes because it's so gradual, it takes somebody who knows you well to say like, hey, what's going on? You're not yourself, or there's something that's a little bit off. But I think it's the gradual repeated trauma that we just don't, we don't recognize that that is, it's cumulative. So what is that? So Patrick, I mean, I can only imagine the emergency room, uh, stressed is your normal way of being, right? Mm -hmm. Staff, patients, I mean, nobody says, oh, let's go to the emergency room for a fun afternoon, bring the ice cream. It's automatically stressed. So what are you noticing as a clinician that says to you something is very different about what we're seeing? Yeah, so I, I think that a lot of the stuff that comes out of the ED is we had this, like, low in volume, right? So um, we had really high volume prior to COVID where, um, you know, we saw hundreds of people a day and kind of everybody is running around um, like crazy. And then we had this period where everything slowed down, right? Where it was slow volume, you had time to think. Um, and since COVID kind of, you know, we, we died down, we came out of lockdown, you know, that, that volume has since came back. And people are really, um, you know, you forgot what it was like to, to work at full volume. And then it came back and people are feeling that stress and um, realizing how tough it was in the first place. And it, it's really affecting people. and um, it, you know, especially in uh, EDs, I feel like people are leaving. They, they're they're trying to walk away from it because they realize that how stressful it's been, and um, they're having difficulties coping with it. How are you, how are they showing up? What are you noticing about them that tells you they're having difficulties? So, a lot of what I see is um, things that you would see clues you would see in patients. So. Um, you see people with pressured speech where they're talking really fast and they're, you could tell the anxiety in their voice and, um, you know, you can see darting eye movements and you can see body language and, and, and posturing and things like that. 
um, that you would, you know, I don't want to say you would see in a psych patient, but there's similar things that I would notice from psych patients. Um, and these are individuals that aren't necessarily, um, you know, th these are our staff, these are our, our colleagues. Um, and they'll have their assignments and they'll have a lot going on. And um, you can see some of those cues and you can see the stress um, building up in them throughout the day. So I want to kind of stop on a point. You said something really important. So um, uh, you mentioned the psych patient. I think one of the hardest things we're having for the whole world, but I can only speak to what I see in front of myself in New England, is that notion around healthy mental process versus impaired. So let's kind of stay in the middle, right? Um, impaired process needing more help, needing therapy, needing medications is one piece. But for most of us, um, we're just not at our optimum behavior, our best mm -hmm. mental health. So one of the articles I was reading recently talks about the impact of excessive cortisol in your system. And Kathy, if you could just kind of jump in, how does that impact our executive functioning and what do we mean by executive functioning? Yeah, so when you're stressed, you're supposed to shut down everything that's not necessary, right? So digestion goes down, your, uh, your frontal lobe is not working as well because you're trying to find the tree to escape from the lion. Your muscles are, are um, hyper-perfused because you're trying to run away. And we can do that for a short period of time, but again, with a repeated, 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 repeated assault, what's actually happening is the frontal cortex that's supposed to feed back to the amygdala, which kind of settles everything down, that connection just gets impaired. And we literally do not have the cognitive functioning that we should have when that's working really well. And there's interesting and scary data with physicians with burnout who are repeatedly stimulated that the frontal cortex where we do all of our uh, most high processing actually thins with, with, um, with burnout. Okay. So you can see it on MRI. So this has real implications for how we behave and our, our, higher, our higher thought processes. So I love talking with the two of you. You're using really big words that I'm having to write down. So I need to break down two things. <laughs> Profused muscles. How does that show up to a non-clinical person? What does that really mean? So if you're using your muscles, you have to feed them energy and oxygen from your blood. So your, your, your blood vessels dilate in your arms and your legs, and they, you get increased blood flow. But you don't need to digest when you're running away from the lion. And so the ones in your, in your core with the stuff that you're not really using shut down a little bit. And so you get – you probably – I'm not sure you would notice it a whole lot, but that's what the body does. And it's, we're not meant to be in that state over and over and over. We can handle bursts, but not all the time. So watching the Olympics, that would explain to me why they're so dehydrated and collapsing as soon as they finish a marathon, right? Yeah, exactly. So I really want to bring it down to this lowest level. So leaving any situation and feeling the muscle fatigue, like you're lightheaded, like you have an dehydration. Is, is one of the, right? So yep. I kind of bring it down. So I'm getting back to some of the things Patrick was talking about around body structure, eye darting, speeding up speech. The things we'd expect if you had just run from a line and couldn't find a tree and you're trying to yep. explain it to me, you're going 100 miles a minute. Awesome. So now that begins to help us understand what we're really talking about and what we're seeing in each other. Um, so I wish we could talk about this for another hour and a half because to me, the executive functioning is really talking about how I'm just organizing my day. So, Patrick, when you're saying now that volume's really high and and people just are struggling, I'm taking in Kathy's comment about layering and thinking while your volume in the ED may have been low during COVID, your parents who are trying to homeschool, new parents, elder concerns, illnesses at home, that ratcheted right up. So they still have been running from the lion just possibly not at the hospital. But now that they are, all that other stuff is still way up here too, right? Right. So I always say the wrong thing to people. I come from a real, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and just get through a kind of mentality sometimes. What have been your successful moments about uh, starting a conversation or talking to somebody so they can begin to realize they need to help themselves a little bit? help to de-stress. What has worked well? Uh, Patrick, let's start with you. What have you noticed that's been working well with the staff? 
Well, I think that one of the things that worked really well is um, we had the, you guys came in and did the um, auricular acupuncture, which is great. It gave people a 15 minute window where I literally went down and I was just grabbing people by the hand and saying, hey, come with me. Um, mm -hmm. Brought them upstairs. They got to spend 15 minutes away from their, their assignments where somebody was able to kind of make sure that their patients were safe and, and gave them that safety blanket there. Um, and then they got to go sit down, have this acupuncture, and people returned feeling amazing. Like people were like, wow, I didn't realize I had this great rush. I feel great. I, I feel like I have more energy. And, and they they felt so uh, rewarded from going up and spending that 15 minutes that that worked really, really well. Um, and I think just giving people the opportunity to get away for that 15 minutes where they're able to do um, something to, you know, to, to recenter themselves work, work really well. Um, some other stuff is people have, uh, we have some massage chairs here that people have been asked to just go up and spend 10 minutes to, you know, relax and get away from um, all the stress of, of the ED environment. Mm -hmm. um, and they've said that that's been really helpful for them as well. Um, I think anything you could do in short first um, works well for, for, for nursing staff at least. Short first. How about Kathy for you? Well, I think a big part of that whole day, those couple of days that we spent up at Mercy, I think part of it was Patrick going and saying, we care that you take a break. We care, and literally leading him by the hand. That started that whole transformation process. So it just made the acupuncture work even better. And I think that's what we're, what we're seeing is that it, when we connect that what you're feeling is real, and that there's a reason. It's not that you're crazy. We just went through COVID. Of course, your shoulders are up around your ears. Of course, your neck is killing you. And of course, you've got your back pain back. Yes. Yep. That's why. And so here's something we can do to start to help you and, and understand, give that little bit of relief so that hopefully it, it cascades over into follow-up. Awesome. So a couple of things, because again, I wish we could talk for an hour and a half. I just want to kind of wrap up and make sure that I've gotten some points really well. Um, first off, so I don't forget, anybody watching this video at the end, I'll make sure that for our colleagues, we remind them about where to get support through CareBridge, our EAP provider, and that there's any concerns about using that services offered through 211 Urban League, in addition to uh, different websites and online therapy services that have become very effective for folks. But what I heard the most today is, uh, Patrick, your trusting relationships with the staff there allowed you to go grab them by the hand. Um, I think it could be really dangerous to try to grab a nurse saying, you need to go relax for five minutes. And <laughs> they, they, they could yeah. hurt me. So, you know, I always joke saying I can still move pretty quickly, so I'm going to go do it anyhow. But trusting relationships. So one of the things I do know is um, if you don't know the person really well, um, try to keep it a little bit high level. High level. How are you doing? How's your family? Um, and based on what they're saying, you might be able to tap in. In trusting relationships, it's really saying, you, you know, you're talking so fast, I'm not sure what you're telling me. Can um, we just stop for a minute? Try to avoid, in my experience of telling people, take a deep breath and calm down. That just it ratchets work. itself. Yeah. It doesn't it, it work. Does. But owning it, saying, I want to understand you. You're talking very fast. I feel you might be stressed. Can we sit and talk? Not talk about it, just sit and talk. Um, and, and the reward of doing something, so you said it really well, Patrick, short bursts. So I think the strongest message I have to everybody around how to help somebody stress, if it's appropriate, see if they'll take a walk with you. Um, if you're wearing masks and, and you can invite them to go do something physical for a few minutes, that's great. But even as individuals, um, I read an article recently that said a cup of coffee and a 20-minute nap will refresh you like, nope, nothing. And I think, Oh, I want eight hours sleep, not 20. Short bursts, changing tiny habits um, can actually yield a big return. But I think the overall message for stress is you won't know how stressed you are until you commit to stopping, breathing, and checking in with yourself. So I want to thank both of you for setting times out of your really busy day, um, for talking with me and helping our colleagues and community understand we're all in this together and we can learn from each other. So. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick.